Okay, we are live. Good evening, good morning. It's TMS Roundtable Global. My name is Dr. Tova Goldfein, and I'm here with my co-host Rose Hoy from Melbourne, Australia. Boker Tov, good morning. Good morning, Tova. Good evening, the world. And we are welcoming our guest, Daphna Mava. Now, Daphna has got a master's in science and she's very interested in the menstrual cycle. And she's working with women in that regard. She actually has groups where women come together. And, you know, if you think about it, with our menstrual cycle, that ova that's in the uterus, in the um, ovary, sorry, has been there a generation back. And, you know, we're all interconnected, whatever we do. We're all, and she has a really deep insight into this, and she's going to share this. Um, one of the other things is that the psychoneurological processes that we do when we menstruate and ovulate uh, actually prepare us for childbirth or prepare us for, um, subtly prepare us for changes in our, in what we have to do as parents, as women, etc. Daphna, thank you so much for joining us. She has got a really interesting background and in, and she's inspirational in her research and understanding mm -hmm. of this issue. So yeah. period, people with period pain, take note because I think that uh, it will speak to you. Thank you, Daphna. Hi. Can you give us a little uh, introduction about yourself and what you do? Uh, so thank you for having me. Um, so I did my master's in epidemiology and public health, and we focused our research in a fertility clinic. Uh, what we did is we checked women uh, before, during, and after uh, they received the hormonal treatments in order to see uh, what effect it would have on their mood. So we uh, tested um, issues regarding depression and anxiety and uh, general stress. Uh, my own personal uh, research was cut very short. It was more like a pilot study, so I don't have uh, very major um, data to share. But besides that, personally, I've been working uh, for about 10 years now um, as an alternative or integrative medicine uh, healer. I also perform um, a method called the IPIC method, which uh, focuses, uh, it uses uh, muscle testing um, to see what's going on and what weakens the body. And then we focus on uh, whatever weakens the body in order to uh, strengthen either the immune system or the mm -hmm. uh, emotional immunity. Uh, be because my own personal love and the topics that I'm interested in are related to fertility and the menstrual cycle and gynecological issues, I've kind of found myself working a lot with um, women with menstrual pain and I've kind of developed my own technique in order to see how to help these women. And what I've found in my work with really a lot of women in these past 10 years is that uh, menstrual pain is very much related to um, ancient pain and ancient grief. And that's uh, what you uh, mentioned about the egg, uh, the ovum being uh, very ancient. So two things yeah. that are very interesting. The first thing is that uh, when we think about it, the egg is uh, two generations old. What do I mean? Uh, I was pregnant last year with my daughter. So when uh, she was uh, an embryo in my uh, in my uterus, she already developed um, her eggs. So her eggs were developed in the year 2020, right? And one day, one of these eggs are going to be my granddaughter. So the egg that belongs so, to my yeah, granddaughter. You say that again, it's amazing. Yeah, Please. so the egg that belongs to my granddaughter already was produced when I was pregnant are already with my there. daughter. So that's already one link that you can see that's, that an egg is already linked, linking between, uh, well, three generations, right? Because it's me, my daughter, and my granddaughter. So that's one thing. Uh, as opposed to the sperm, which a sperm is being created every 60 days, it's something very quick, just like men are, you know, every day, the energetics of men are, is very quick, very like, tuck, tuck, tuck. Uh, the energetics of being female is something that is very ancient, it takes time. And even if we, for me, for, you know, my own personal example is that my grandmothers, um, well, my maternal grandmother was in the Holocaust. So the egg 
that I was created by, uh, was in the Holocaust. So that's even yeah. one um, link that we can see about what I, what I mean when I talk about um, ancient grief or ancient pain. Uh, so that's one uh, one thing that uh, we should uh, focus on. This, the second thing that uh, is really interesting to think of is what is called mitochondrial DNA. So we all know that we have DNA in each one of our cells. Uh, besides our regular DNA in every cell, we also have another kind of DNA, which is called mitochondria. The mitochondria is the one, uh, in, is a, a singular um uh, organelle in the cell that is in charge of uh, creating energy, right? So we eat food and that food needs to be translated into energy and the mitochondria does that. Uh, evolutionary speaking, mitochondria, we now um, assume uh, the theory is that mitochondria was a different type of organism which migrated into our cells in order to create what is called a symbiosis, right? So oh, really? Wow. Yeah, wow. so it has a different DNA. So in every cell in our body, we have our own DNA and we also have the mitochondrial DNA. Which is That's, from? Which, oh, so just a sec, I, I, I'm building it up. So uh, that mitochondrial DNA is um, completely separated from ours and it um, evolves in a different pace. So our DNA has a, diff has a specific mutation rate, right? Every X generations, there is a mutation. The mitochondrial DNA uh, has a very slow mutation rate, much slower than our own personal DNA. So you can kind of look back, if you look at it as a biological clock, and every time there's a mutation, you can go back to that mitochondrial DNA if we know there's a mutation every so generations, and we can kind of go back to the origins. Um, the interesting thing about mitochondrial DNA, why am I going on and on about it, is that mitochondrial DNA only comes from the mother. It doesn't yeah. come from the father. Why? A sperm has a lot of mitochondria because a sperm needs to, um, has a lot of energy to swim. But when the sperm enters the egg, it drops all the mitochondria, it leaves everything out in the tail, and it doesn't have any mitochondria that enters into the egg. Fantastic. Um, also, uh, the egg is huge. The egg is a very, very big cell. The, um, when, like, for example, when you think about it, an egg of a chicken is just one cell. I mean, it's a very big cell. Uh, what's the smallest cell? Atom? In, in the human body? An at protein? Proton? A sperm. So it's a very uh, really? funny polarity. The sperm yeah. is 10,000 times smaller than the egg. So yeah. the egg has a lot of mitochondria in it. And that mitochondria is being transferred to oh, uh, okay. us all through our uh, female lineage. So um, let's uh, put this together. If we know that um, the mitochondria only comes from the mother, and if we know that the mitochondria has a very slow mutation rate and you can kind of use it as a biological clock to go backwards and to study um, evolution. You can see uh, that you can kind of go back to the original woman through mitochondria. And that's something that's kind of been done theoretically. It's called the mitochondrial Eve. You can read more about it. Wow. Uh, it was sometime in our evolutionary, in our evolutionary um, beginning in Africa. There was that first woman that you can kind of go back and see through mitochondrial time. And we all carry um, in that DNA some kind of uh, information, whether it's information for the mitochondria itself or information of what I personally believe, some kind of memories that are built up throughout the uh, female maternal lineage. So the whole concept of uh, having a female, female sorry, lineage is real. Um, we do have in every cell in our body everything that women went through ever in the past. And women went through a lot. Uh, they went through um, uh, genocides. Uh, they went through, um, uh, um, what's it called? Witchcraft, uh, what's it called? Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember in English the term of when they burned the witches. Uh, the they state. went... Yeah. yeah, so they went through a lot of trauma. 
And my own personal um, understanding when I work with period pain is that when women go through uh, a menstrual cycle, there is a time in the month where, when they ovulate and everything is, uh, well, we'll get to it later, but when women ovulate, their senses are heightened and they're very sharp and they're out, um, you know, finding a mate. So their sense of smell and their sense of um, hearing and their, uh, what do we have? Smell, hearing, sight. Hearing. So their sense of sight is much sharper and they're very alert. And then there's a time of the month where they kind of gather inwards and uh, their senses are not as sharp. Their uh, pain threshold is lower. They're uh, kind of going into um, a different state of mind um, where everything floods upwards. And that everything that floods upwards is usually, from my experience, is very ancient wounds that we don't even know where they're from because they're very ancient. And that's why it's so painful. Um, Wow. So I've developed uh, in my own uh, personal practice groups with women where we just give room to address that pain. The problem is that women many times feel guilty, like, what's my problem? Why am I in pain? Why can't I function normally? It's not that you can't function normally. Of course, everything is fine. I mean, it's just a little bit painful, but it is very nice to kind of address these old pains. And I personally believe that it's also an opportunity to, to heal you know, your grandmother's wound as well, and, you know, to do that service for her, not just for you. So, yeah, that's, Beautiful. sorry that I've been no, so passionate about that topic. Amazing. Yeah. You really brought it down to, to an understandable level. Go ahead, Rose. Um, Daphne, so, recently I read an article and it suggests that the ova actually chooses which sperm to allow through the what's the um, layer on the outside layer? I can't remember anymore. Zona pellucida. Yes, it actually, that's one specific. Um, yeah. Sperm. Can Can you elaborate on that for our audience? Because, I mean, I know it's just an aside, but I thought how amazing that the ova yeah. has got a mind of its own virtually. Yeah. Yeah. So is, what is happens is that, that of the, is that because of the mitochondria? Uh, well, it's not known how the what's the mechanism of how the egg can choose uh, the sperm, but what we can see that's happening uh, is that the miracle of life is literal, because uh, the egg is there. Um, it's um, in the process of ovulation. We have the ovaries, and then we have uh, the fallopian tubes, and then we have the uterus. Right. So the ovaries is like a gland that sits. Sorry, where am I? It sits here, and then it's linked to the fallopian tube. Mm -hmm. uh, and that fallopian tube is what uh, is like a tube that brings it into the uterus. Every month we ovulate uh, just one egg. Um, and that process of, of, of releasing that egg is called ovulation. Um, so, and by the way, usually it's one uh, ovary that is the dominant one because uh, many wow. women think that it's like every Wait, month. Two ovaries oh, come down? Wow. Just, no, no. The, um, Okay, I have this funny little model here. Oh, lovely. <laughs> okay. okay. So, can you see it okay? Yeah. Where am I? Okay. So, these are the ovaries. This, where am I? This yeah. is the fallopian tube. This is the uterus. This is the opening of the uterus, which is the cervix. And this is the uh, vagina. Yeah. So, the, so we have two ovaries and each of them contain uh, a few thousand uh, eggs. When, when we're uh, embryos, it's a few million eggs. When we are born, it's already 400,000 eggs. Uh, and then when we mat uh, sexually mature, uh, we have a few, a potential of a few uh, hundred eggs, uh, between 400 and 500 eggs, which will ovulate, meaning will be released every month, between 400 and 500. Obviously, we're not supposed to have 400 to 500 children. So um, my own personal belief is that um, these eggs have a different potential in them from just besides just having children. Um, so, yeah. Every, that makes sense, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So every month, uh, one egg is being released. And usually there's one dominant um, ovary. So it's not like one month here and one month there. It's usually there's you know, maybe 80% of the time you'll have one ovary that, that's the dominant one. And then the um, uh, rest of the time, it will be the other one. 
So the egg is being kind of released, which is what the ovulation is. And then it sits here for 24 hours. That's it, just 24 hours. It's a very short window. That's why it's not usually that easy to get pregnant and you have to time it right. So, and then it sits here for 24 hours. If a sperm came through here, uh, some of it will go in the, where am I? In the wrong direction. Uh, some of it will go in the right direction. Uh, we don't know if the sperm can kind of smell or sense the egg and, yeah. and go yeah. in the right direction. So we don't know if it's half and half or are they really uh, drawn into the egg. But uh, when they do enter, they will come here and they will meet the egg here. So that's why, uh, because the sperm can last between three to five days uh, in the in the female body, uh, most pregnancy, most successful pregnancies happen from intercourse that happen two days before ovulation, because the egg is only there for 24 hours, and you don't want the meet you don't want to meet the egg in hour 23. Right, so it's better that the sperm wait for the egg. Just like you know, when a when a guy comes to the woman she, for the day, she gets organized and he waits. That's uh, how it is. So uh, then uh, the egg uh, the egg meets the sperm, right? Which is again, she's ten thousand uh, times bigger than the sperm. Uh, you can actually see a human egg uh, with your naked eye. It would be maybe the size of a dot you'd make with your pen. Uh, as opposed to the sperm, which is, yeah, um, much, much smaller. Microscopic, yeah. Yeah. Uh, when the egg meets the sperm, um, there is a magical process that happens that the sperm leaves the tail behind because it doesn't uh, have any mitochondrial DNA uh, or mitochondria that enters. So it enters into the, um, into the egg. The minute it enters, there is like a, a, um, a literal aura. Energy um that that you can see um maybe we can put it in the comments later um because you can see it on youtube like the literal aura that happens the egg just expands and what expands is uh that layer called zona pellucida uh, which is the outer layer of the egg and its purpose is to reject any other sperm that comes in because oh. once one sperm it's so unbelievable yeah uh once it, one sperm enters that's it. That's the, it. The egg doesn't That's want it. any. The doors, the doors, yeah, the doors <laughs> closed. And it's actually a very smart uh, biological process because if another sperm would come in, we'd have too much of a DNA. It would be like, yeah. what? never mind, but it would be kind of like one and a half of a person, and we want it to be one person. So uh, the zona pellucida expands, and you can actually see some kind of aura. Another beautiful thing that happens is that there's an explosion of zinc. Um, we don't know why, but there's an explosion of, of zinc. And so it's kind of like a, a literal spark of life because when we color the zinc, you can just see a of, uh, oh. of, a, of a spark. Um, and then the egg starts to become and a fertilized egg and then it becomes why, an embryo. Yeah. Why do we, do we, have we studied why this ovary will choose that sperm? So we don't know how it chooses. Um, so I, I, I just don't know how to answer that because science doesn't know the answer to that question, but we just know that it, there is some kind of uh, biochemical mechanism there that um, decides which sperm and which egg, and we can go into the, ener you know, the energy field behind it, whether it's mm -hmm. some kind of soul that decides to come here and needs that specific DNA to, in order to succeed in life. And, who knows? Yeah, like the, it's, a, it's as vast as the universe, isn't it? And, you know, as you've been speaking, I've been thinking about the universe and, and how the sun is sort of like we're circling around the sun and, uh, and in a way yeah. the over is, is the life within, within our bodies that yeah. creates that, yeah, that it's, internal sort of universe. It's yeah. very interesting. The egg is also very uh, in sync with the, with the moon. So, oh, uh, of course, because in, in labor ward, we know we always know when we're going to be busy. Yeah, really? Yeah, when would that be? <laughs> oh, I think at full moon, I can't full remember. When the pressure, okay. baromic, baromic pressure goes up, yeah. yeah. So, it we don't know what you know, 
because we don't have documentation of it, but it does make sense that ovulation would correlate with the moon because uh, ovulation correlates with for many other um, types of organisms. Like for example, for you in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, there's a specific time of full moon of either March or April when there is a mass ovulation and uh, in, in the Great Barrier Reef and lots of animals mm -hmm. go by that by that clock. Uh, so it makes sense that it would originally have been the same for us and, and originally um, uh, an entire cycle was 28 days, which is exactly the, the time of the moon. It also yeah. makes sense because the moon is in charge of, our, of the tide. So it's in charge of pulling the waters and every cell of our body is 70% water. So even if we don't feel it because you know we have artificial light, um, still we get pulled Every cell in our body gets pulled uh, by by the moon, so it makes sense oh, that this would be the biological yeah. Uh, clock. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Now, now tell us. Come come back now to why and how the chronic pain occurs from your insights, um, because the story you've given us is just so amazing. And now we're going to look at sort of how. It's not that it goes wrong, I suppose, but that emotionally um, the suffering, this intergenerational suffering comes up. Can you um, expand on that now a little bit too? So I've, it's, it just started for me with working with a lot of women uh, that have uh, this menstrual pain. And we, you know, at first they always feel guilty. Like, what's my problem? maybe you know there's something that i'm suppressing they always feel like very guilty that they're suppressing something or and i always want to encourage them that it's not about guilt and it's not about suppression it's just that sometimes we carry stuff um, and then i always ask them if they feel that there's something that their uterus is grieving about and then usually when i ask that question you know the answer is immediately arises that yeah you know I've always felt that because my mother was sexually abused, then this or that, or I always felt, so sometimes it's um, intergenerational pain. Sometimes it's pain that was related to us. Uh, I brought like, for example, a very interesting um, article that just came out uh, three months ago. Uh, it's from the um, uh, Journal for Environmental Research and Public Health. Uh, it was a study that was uh, done in Japan and, and it looked into PMS, so premenstrual syndrome and childhood maltreatment. I just got it because uh, I get notifications uh, for uh, research in my field. I just got it like a few days ago. So it showed that women that had childhood maltreatment um, had 50% more risk developing PMS, uh, specifically physical or emotional abuse. Interestingly, sexual abuse was not correlated. Uh, and it was a, a study that was done uh, in Japan on almost 4,000 women. Um, so uh, they saw in this research that 80% of women who didn't go through childhood maltreatment also had PMS. So because PMS is something that so many women experience. Uh, but the women who did have uh, childhood maltreatment, uh, specifically uh, physical or emotional abuse, uh, so uh, almost 85% of them had PMS and uh, it was significantly um, different from the ones who didn't. So that's just even one example that, that they've seen here um, of how um, ancient pain um, will affect our cycle. Um, so my like understanding of why that happens is that every, let me use my model here again, um, every month in order to receive the egg and to prepare for a potential pregnancy, we develop a very thick uh, uterine wall. And that uterine wall yes. is charged with, you know, uh, a lot of emotions and a lot of um, memories and everything that we're going through. And then every month when we don't get pregnant, uh, that uterine wall sheds uh, and it's a very thick wall. It started from one millimeters and it grew for, it grew to 10 millimeters uh, in, a, in a matter of two or three each weeks. Month, each month? Each month, yeah. Just imagine yeah. like if your arm would grow 10 times each month, it's, it's, it's major, <laughs> right? So that, that uterine wall, it suddenly sheds and it sheds with blood. And, and that's what we 
experience when we bleed, when when we when, when we menstruate. Right. So most of it is not blood, but it's a very thick uterine wall, which used to be very fertile because it was potentially wanting to support um, a pregnancy. And then the next month it happens again. So, um, uh, and then we are, it's also interesting to kind of see it that um, when we kind of shed uh, that, sorry, that uterine uh, lining, it's not symmetrical. So it's not that it sheds uh, a symmetrical layer, but it's like sometimes it sheds more here, sometimes it sheds more there. And then like, let's say that this part was more um, shed this month and then this part wasn't, but it will regrow. So sometimes when we shed, we shed uh, areas that are from when I was 14 and sometimes we shed areas that were just from this month. So that's why every uh, cycle will look different because sometimes I'm kind of experiencing um, um, what I went through when I was, a child sometimes uh, it's something that was just uh, a month old and it explains why every time that process is it could be uh, more um, emotional or less emotional um, if we kind of use it uh, um, in a way that is uh, healing and helpful for us and we kind of don't and we're and we're not afraid of the pain and that's the tricky part not to be afraid of the pain because pain is something that's very hard to cope with. Uh, so if we're not afraid of the pain and we're uh, kind of able to go through it, and that's why it's easier to do in a group because we have the group, the, the, the support of the group, then uh, we can heal these these areas that we're sitting in our uterus from who knows when. Uh, so that's cannot, what, what I yeah. do in my ceremonies. Fantastic. Tell me, would that create problems with fertility? Um, it, not Not necessarily. Like the shedding of the uterine wall, like um, the new, the new sort of growth, you know, would that mean that when when the egg and the um, has already been fertilized, and then it lands in the in the uterus, and then it it clings to the wall, mm -hmm. is the new wall or the old wall better? Put it that uh, way. No. Like, I mean, that's it, just, that's the natural process. Uh, that's how it's okay. done. That's how so it's, it's designed. Not... It shouldn't create any fertility problems. Uh, there are okay. uh, specific gynecological problems that we know um, that are very frustrating, but biologically are also very interesting um, that are linked in a way to fertility problems, um, even though it's a question of what came first. Uh, and endometriosis, for example, endometriosis is... Uh, what happens when uh, that uterine wall doesn't grow just in the uterus itself, but it migrates to different t different areas of the body. So most typically it would be in the fallopian tubes or it would sit on the ovary or it would sit somewhere um, in, um, in uh, the, the areas between the vagina and the, and the opening of the digestive system. And the problem, uh, uh, with it is that uterine uh, lining that is now somewhere else in the body, it would still react to the same hormones. So yes. if, uh, if in the uterus it gets a signal to now bleed and start shedding, it would happen the same in different uh, areas of the body and then it becomes very, very painful. Uh, one in yeah. 10 women uh, suffer from endometriosis and it's a very frustrating uh, disease. Um, Again, in my personal experience, it's also something that's linked to uh, ancient pain. And that, uh, from what I've seen, is usually intergenerational pain. So usually that's something that your mother or your grandmother mother went through and you're kind of bleeding that their pain. Uh, endometriosis was is linked to uh, fertility problems, but it's a question of what came first because endometriosis can go undetected for many years because we all know that it's difficult to go the, to, to go to the doctor and, and complain about uh, menstrual pain and be taken seriously. So women, women with endometriosis, um, even now in 2021, are eight to 10 years um, uh, late in their diagnosis. So meaning that from the time they go to the doctor till the time they get an official diagnosis, eight to 10 years. But women who go to fertility clinics are uh, being uh, searched very well to try and find uh, the problem. And some of them will have endometriosis. So 
it is said that it's linked. My own personal belief is that it, uh, if you want to get pregnant, everything will be fine. Yeah, yeah I think pregnancy yeah. is the, the, the part of the healing to just, you know, um, yeah. I, I, you know, the, I've last week on, on the show with Marav, we had um, two women that had, you know, childhood traumas and, and in, in this childhood. And, um, you know, one of them had endometriosis and the other one had uh, horrible vagina pain. And Rose and I have met some clients who've had horrible pelvic pain, like horrible pelvic pain that, you know, or, or arousal pain. And we, we had a client, we had our first guest a year and a half ago was a woman who went to 25 doctors, 25 doctors because of enormous amount of pain that was like this kind of arousal pain. It was just, at some point it was just horrible. And she had, she did not have trauma in this lifetime. And she went to, she thought, oh, a hypnotist, whatever, what would I have to lose? She didn't even know about TMS or anything. And she lied down there and the woman just calmed her brain and she didn't have any pain. And she thought, what? It's a, it's mental. Like she just couldn't even connect. So I am sure with the, 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 that your pain is so great. You can't even imagine it being emotional, but we know that the body mind connection. So there's enormous amount of pelvic pain syndromes. It feels like it's like a new condition. What, what do you hear about that? Daphne? Um, well, another a very unbased theory that I've developed is the whole, um, you know, how we suspect that estrogen is carcinogenic, meaning that estrogen uh, yeah. is linked to uh, specific types of cancer. Uh, for me, that's something that's, uh, I mean, it's been shown in research, but that's something that kind of very much pisses me off because it makes no evolutionary sense that a natural hormone would yeah. cause cancer. I mean, we wouldn't be able to evolve as a species. Um, the fact that estrogen, which is the most um, female hormone there is, is linked to cancer just shows how we have uh, a very conflictual uh, relationships with what is called female. Uh, so, yeah. And science. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, it, it has been shown, uh, it has been shown that there is a link between estrogen and specific kinds of cancer, yeah. but it, it evolutionary wise doesn't make any sense no. to me. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I, Good I, point. I see that from what I understand, it's, um, it just shows how, how the, co the conflicts that we have with what, what is called being female, because estrogen is the female hormone there is. And if we have, if as a woman, I have. Uh, you know, an inner war with what is called being female because the entire uh, culture has a war with what is called being female. It would make sense why uh, I would have a complex relationship with the female hormone also. Right. Oh, perfectly yeah. said. Well um, said. Well said. Could you... Uh, oh, actually, Sarah's That's question, question. Is Yeah. Excellent. But could, before we answer yeah. Sarah's question, yeah. I was wondering um, about breast cancer, for example, it's a it's a particular marker. Where does that marker come from? Where does it sit? Is what, it you mean biological marker? marker? Yeah. I'm sorry, right. it's not my field so much, so I wouldn't know how yeah. to answer that. I don't okay. uh, work a lot no, with I, cancer. Yeah, I'm just looking at the whole idea of estrogen being the problem. But I'm... Um, I don't think that estrogen say, is the problem. problem. That's the thing. No. I think that, that the culture... The, 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 the culture uh, is yeah. uh, the problem. Yeah. Um, the the you can say the uh, medical scientific system has been able has found. So I don't think it's men. Know. Also, I think it's I just a, a culture. I don't think it's men. Also, I think men are also uh, victims of the same kind of culture. Uh, I think that it's just that there's um, a collective body of pain uh, in the entire culture that is very much. Um, intimidated by women, um, 
uh, that is very depressing women and is very blaming on men. I think there's a lot of um, lack of peace between uh, men and women. I also think, I mean, if we always fantasize about how it used to be in the old days when women, uh, matriarch uh, societies and when women ruled and men were the stupid ones knowing nothing. I think that's also something that's very uh, un imbalanced. Uh, so it would make yeah. sense maybe why it shifted in the other direction, but I think it's definitely time for both genders to make a peace process between the others. There, there's no, just as there is, a, you know, a, a sacred femininity, there's all, that we are all, you know, talking about these days and we're very much empowered by the sacred femininity. There's also sacred masculinity. Uh, men can be sacred as well. Uh, they can rise exactly. into, rise up into their higher potential and be empowered by that. And both genders needs to explore that and to make a peace process uh, between themselves so that estrogen could be a sacred female hormone and testosterone could be a sacred male hormone. So inspiring. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, Sarah's question is very good because it really speaks about what you've been talking about. Can you, see it? Can you see it, Daphna? Yeah. Uh, should I read it out loud or? Yeah, please do. Yes, please. Okay, yeah. so Sarah says, I'm afraid that my daughter is now dealing with my intergenerational trauma as evidenced by her uh, premenstrual syndrome. Uh, do you have any suggestions about how to break this cycle? Um, so I think, first of all, Sarah, uh, it's very courageous of you to... Um, to face that and acknowledge that and um, to face that, to acknowledge that link because the problem is, the problem with pain is that it's very painful. <laughs> I mean, obviously, but it's very painful to look at uh, and it takes a lot of resources uh, in order to look at that pain. And that's something that is more easily done when we're in a group. Something very beautiful that Sarah and her daughter can do uh, is look together at that intergenerational pain. Uh, for example, they can um, create like a tree, a family tree, uh, where Sarah is there and her daughter is there and uh, the husband is there and the grandmother is there. You know, create a comp uh, an entire tree um, that goes back and even just acknowledge and speak out loud about the traumas that happened in the generations before and kind of, you know, make some kind of healing drawing uh, drawings around that tree, anything that is, um, you know, associative um, and is relevant for them. And also, uh, you know, create some kind of ceremony between you and your daughter, Sarah. And um, when I think the, the finishing of that ceremony uh, for you, Sarah, would be uh, first uh, to yeah. out loud speak and release your or release and liberate your daughter from that pain. So uh, literally, uh, you know, say out loud that she's uh, that you're releasing her from your pain and that she's liberated from your pain and uh, that she doesn't have to carry that loyalty right. to you through her pain. So that she, that she can cut it and to uh, ask your daughter to also trust you that you can be responsible of your own pain and you can heal it so she doesn't have to do it for you. So uh, that would be a nice uh, ending for that ceremony. And the next phase would be to go and uh, look at your own trauma with uh, you know, a specialized uh, uh, person um, in order to really address your pain. And, um, and then both generations, uh, both you and your daughter heal. I'd also like to add to that, Sarah, and thanks so much for coming to our show and welcome. Um, you know, epigenetics, we know that now that that we can change, you know, it's like we can stop the psychological buck right here and we can change it by the environment, by mm -hmm. accepting. I mean, you know, we all know that we'd be in a bad mood and our dads would say, oh, are, you, are you, you having your period? Like, you know, or my grandmother from Russia would be like, don't have girls, they're, they're weak, you know, so we know that, you know, we know that this is a voice and this is a, this is I'm something I'm still repeating, but, voice sort of thing. but, but it's like, I know that, that I haven't followed that. I know that I heard that and it was sort of, so epigenetics was that I changed my environment. I, 
you know, I, I raised two girls and, you know, they're, they're strong and, or that they know, you know, it's, 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 it's mind over matter. It's, it's more like things are not hereditary anymore. Things are not genetically, like, even if the, the cell is there, we're talking right now about the, the, um, the, the art of the cell and that what I think and what I believe creates my cells more than my cells create what I believe and think. Yeah. So, Sarah, you're in a good generation. It's, it's a, it's a world of, of where the brain possibility, possibility yeah. and miracles are happening all the time. And like Ben Gorian said, uh, you'd have to have, you have to be a realist to, to believe in miracles and, and then, <laughs> You, you know, miracles can happen to everyone and everyone can have one. It's not something like out of the movies anymore. It's, um, and I think that your daughter's very lucky to have you as a mom, Sarah. So the best of luck with that. Yeah. Another really um, beautiful exercise that I like to do with women. This is uh, taken from um family constellation which is a method that looks into the dynamics in our family and specifically intergenerational trauma uh, so what we do in this exercise uh, that's something that you can do either with yourselves or if you if you have a mother or a daughter that could be even more beautiful and powerful to do it with them uh, you kind of uh, choose objects which will uh, i have that here sorry um I, I keep having these tools here. Really, um, so uh, in, in the Israeli version of Family Constellation, they use these uh, kind of uh, small fabrics uh, to, um, uh, what's it called? To signify um, symbolize, each generation. Symbolize. Yeah, sorry, symbolize uh, each uh, generation. So what you can do in order to look at a female uh, ancient pain is you can create a line of all the women that came before you. So it would be a line of a lot of um, this is, right? Um, so you create kind of a line on the floor of all the women that came before you. Uh, this, these are just, uh, you know, an example of these fabrics that uh, my partner does um, um, family constellations. So that's why we have it here because he, he teaches that all the time. Uh, but it could, you know, just be the pieces of fabrics that you have in your home or just pieces of paper. So you make a line of like your uh, maternal lineage and it starts with you and then uh, your mother, your grandmother and so on. And it ultimately will reach into the first mitochondrial Eve, right? That first woman. And once you, you know, have all that line in front of you, you can go and visit each woman. You can go and step, like literally stand on, on that fabric on the, or on that piece of paper of every mother and grandmother that was there. And, you know, for a moment when you're uh, standing on that piece of fabric, you're kind of channeling her, your grandmother or your great grandmother or your great, 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 great and so on. Um, and you channel her and you experience what she went through. And um, if she had some kind of pain that was passed, that you sense that is passed along to you, you can kind of thank her uh, and push that pain back into her uh, and, you know, create that separation between you and her. Um, um, declare that your loyalty to the family doesn't have to go through pain, but it can go through you know, memories and nostalgia and, and other beautiful um, uh, ways to, to remember uh, your ancestors. And you can kind of go and visit each woman. That's something that um, I've done with, uh, with a lot of women. And it's very interesting what comes up. Like suddenly we, you know, a woman would be going through uh, on, like standing on each piece of fabric. And then when she's on the eighth past generation, she would send a, suddenly feel like, wow, my ovaries, it's so painful, I can't take it. And then we kind of do a healing process uh, to let go of that. Whoa. I think it's something also that's very um, comforting in a way, knowing that it's not my fault. Uh, that pain, mm. that mm. female pain is very, uh, very old. Uh, mm. A lot of women in the in the present, but mostly in the past, suffered a lot. Um, when we think about it, uh, almost 100% of us 
at some point in our past is a result of rape. Uh, even like the, when you think about it, that almost uh, so many of us has Mongolian DNA from the Mongolian Empire. Empire. I live in Israel. What am I related to uh, Mongolian DNA? And it's because that at some point in my past, some woman was raped by a, a soldier in the Mongolian Empire. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, it sits, it sits in us, and um, when we become aware of it, and we, when we acknowledge it, we can heal from it, and it doesn't have to sit in us, in our cells, in our uterus, in our uh, gynecological system anymore. Yeah, one of my, one of the, I think one of the greatest books in the world, and you know, I read it before I came to Israel. It was called The Red Tent by mm -hmm. Anita. Dom, Dominic, diamond diamond and it's really amazing it's an amazing thing it's like your grief ceremonies i mean on a small intimate basis because you know rachel our foremothers were this yeah you know, they'd come together every month and sit together when they're having their period and everyone would take the women would take care of each other and it would be can you imagine i think we would not be having home we would be just so distracted with love and compassion self-compassion yeah love and we all know that we put we put a hot pack on our stomach and we feel better we put a hot pack on our kidneys we feel better it's you know there's all this healing energy and i imagine if that was happening we wouldn't have developed into endometriosis we wouldn't have developed we would have been healing those we wouldn't need to look back we wouldn't need to go back because we'd be like we're okay that's that i'm here it's like it's sort of like we were taught that you know, um, in a way, I hope that this would happen too. Uh, but in, another voice in my head is always kind of cautious about that fantasy of how life would have been amazing if only. I think <laughs> that, and I, I, that brings me to uh, what you mentioned um, uh, at, at the introduction that every month we menstruate and we go through an emotional wave. And I think it's for a reason. Um, so I think yeah. it's a chance to release whatever is being uh, charged and whatever is being built, whether it's this month or it's, you know, as I said, like from age 14 or from my mother or my grandmother or whatever. Uh, it's a chance to, to release something. And it's so beautiful to, to, to see it that way and to use that experience to... Uh, be able to, you know, uh, release everything that was built up this month and finally be able to release it. Like, you know, I always p imagine it like a balloon uh, full of water, like when we were kids and we used to, you know, uh, make, um, yeah. yeah, so it just drops and it's such a nice relief. Um, so it's kind of like, I guess, as a midwife, you, you, re you can resonate it, you can resonate with it a lot. You can also call it painful, um, but it's mostly, it could be an opportunity to really go in deep into um, an instinctual mode that is very meditative. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. Actually, I, I, as we reflect now, um, um, that is how it is, isn't it? Like, as you describe it, that's what unconsciously that happens to us but of course because we're all busy and going to work and rearing children etc etc um we don't pause to actually no. acknowledge that or honor it even because it's a beautiful or if we take the pill describe. yeah tell uh, us or if we take that. the pill which is if we take the pill which is something that um more than half of the population of women take it's also something that's silencing uh, that entire cycle. Everything that we describe, you know, the egg being released and the uterine lining growing, it doesn't happen at all. There's just a silencing of hormones. There is no building. There is no, there's nothing. Um, then women usually, it's just a, a silence. Nothing grows, nothing is changing. There's just a hormone, hormonal flat line. Um, so yeah. Um, I, I would hope, I would recommend to any woman, when she has the time, we don't have the time to do it every month. Obviously, we're very busy. But when we do have the time, and it doesn't have to take a long time, it can be, you know, once a month or once every two months, if you don't have the energy to do it once a month, thankfully, you have the next opportunity the next month to just take two hours, 
close the door, be by yourself, or if you're lucky enough to be with other menstruating women, and really do your own processes in releasing whatever needs to be released, whether it's the blood itself that needs to be released or whether it's actual crying and uh, grieving that, you know, buried grief, buried pain that's not even yours to shed everything through the, through the tears, through the eyes, through uh, your lower openings. I always also uh, encourage women to kind of imagine that besides blood, there's also a lot of energetical contact that is being dropped. So every time when they're um, in their um, heavy time of the month where it feels like really crampy and you're just, you feel like you can't. <laughs> so you close the door and you take really nice deep sighs, you know, and you can finally allow yourself to release everything, to kind of sigh not only through your mouth, but also through your lower openings and release everything. Just imagine that everything is shedding and after two hours, you can open the door and you're like new and you're ready for the world again. And in two weeks, you're going to ovulate again and you're going to be focused and you're going to be sharp and you're going to be in your zone and you're going to get stuff done in two hours instead of in one week because you're so sharp and uh, your focus and your attention is so, you know, there, your pheromones are. Uh, so ultimately, you'd get things done much quicker uh, if you focus it around ovulation time and during the time of the month where uh, you bleed, you give yourself the permission wow. to release. Um, another very interesting study that also uh, I, I, I uh, got this week uh, was about, uh, let me find it here. Um, yeah, uh, premenstrual syndrome, syndromes and work, uh, work-related uh, issues. They wanted to see uh, how does PMS affect our work. Of course, we can function in our work. It's not like we're going crazy or anything, but women uh, do tend to uh, take time off work uh, when they're premenstruating. Uh, they found in this, uh, in this study that women will want to maybe take some time off. They wouldn't uh, tell their managers uh, that that was the reason. First, because it's embarrassing. And also most of the time the managers are men and men like won't get it. Um, and in this study, um, they kind of asked women, what would you like? What would help you uh, feel um, more welcomed with your PMS? And most women uh, mostly said that all they want to see is to be acknowledged. Oh. They just want to be acknowledged, to be understood, and to be accepted, to be able to talk about it, and that's all they need. So even if you are in your office, and, uh, and by the way, that uh, research eventually went, uh, and it, this was a research, a research that was done in the UK, uh, so eventually they had recommendations of how to help these women and how to educate the managers, mostly men, that PMS is normal. 90% of women have it. 51% of the population is female. It's okay. It's okay to talk about it. It's okay to take a break. We're not robots. Women specifically don't function the same every day. They have the time of the month where they ovulate, where they get stuff done and their focus and their attention is amazing. And then they have two hours in a month, which they want to dig in and, and focus and heal themselves and ultimately heal wow. the world yeah. <laughs> through it. Yeah. Um, just yeah. Uh, one thing that I wanted to add, if it's okay, uh, if I go back to this model is about a physical. Um, I just want to know where you got that. I just need to know where you got that. Oh, uh, a very you dear friend of mine, uh, uh, I did. a past friend of mine, uh, her name is Hila Fuchs uh, and she makes uh, these sweet puppets. She now lives in Canada, um, oh. <laughs> and she made this one for me. She was generous enough to make it for to uh, to make it for free because she was so excited about the cause and about educating women. And <sighs> it was very lovely of her. And uh, it's beautiful and it's sweet. And uh, it most is. women say that it it looks like huggy, and uh, I love it. I've been <laughs> it using does. it for for uh, yeah ten years, now. and it's so anatomically accurate. It, it also is amazing. The, uh, you know, um, so the way the uterus uh, sits is in our body is that it's it, it looks this way. If this is sorry, if this is my belly and this is my back, this is how the uterus uh, sits. So this is my belly, right? So just imagine that the blood needs to make a very kind of zigzaggy um, 
uh, passage when it um, when it like needs a to leave. Like a windy road. Yeah. So it also would explain why it's painful when the blood comes out because for the blood to come out, the uterus kind of shrinks, and that yeah. it needs to do the zigzag in order to release the blood. So something that's uh, a specific posture is which also very help um, is to work with. Um, Gravity. Uh, with gravity and not against gravity. So if you lay on your back, sorry, it's not helpful. The blood, it's harder yeah. for the blood to Ooh. flow out. Yeah. But yeah. if you lay on your belly, when you're in your pain, it's, so even if a woman is like wow. exhausted, she can't handle the pain and she can't handle, handle the emotional you know, process, even just laying on your belly is helpful. But also being in squatting position it's very helpful because when we're in squatting position, everything uh, becomes straight and then it's easier for the blood to uh, be released. And also the good thing about uh, squatting position is that it kind of forces our lower openings to stay open. It's very hard to keep tight when we're in a squatting position. Uh, when we feel the pain of the, menstru the, the menstrual pain, pain usually our initial reaction when we have pain is like, ah, all right, it's very, Oh, yes. yeah, yeah, and when we um, uh, shrink uh, because of the pain, it's harder for the blood to come out. Mm -hmm. uh, so for a woman to uh, either be laying down if she's very tired and, and exhausted or being in a squatting position or even, you know, any kind of shape where her knees are touching the floor and her um, uh, pelvis is higher. So it's kind of the same, similar to squatting position. Um, that's something that's very helpful for the blood to flow and combining that with nice deep sighs and combining that with the emotional process, with crying, everything that you need to cry could be a very beautiful uh, process to do. And it's something that you can even see as being lucky to do that um, wow. every month. Yeah. Here's another question from Tamar Bell. Mm -hmm. What about pain during ovulation? Yeah, okay, so sometimes women um, experience pain uh, when they ovulate. The pain uh, when we ovulate is usually different. It's kind of like a sharp pain that women describe like as a needle and we feel it uh, more um, in the sides of our lower abdomen because uh, the location of the ovaries is different. Uh, pain that we feel during ovulation, it has been linked to around ovulation, but it hasn't been shown that like logically we think that it would be like when the egg pops out right from the ovary but it hasn't been uh, proven that that's what happened so we know that it's sometime around ovulation uh, usually that pain um, is much shorter so it could be a few minutes um, that's what most women experience if you feel that the pain is longer i would uh, recommend to go get checked with your OBGYN because we want to see that there is no major cysts there that are sitting in the ovaries and that might be uh, the reason for that pain. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I remember hearing, and I didn't learn anything about this, you know, in chiropractic school, but I remember hearing, and I always wondered about the relationship with the kidneys. Are the kidneys swelling a little bit during the period? Or um, the kidneys swell during pregnancy, from what I know. I, I'm not familiar with them swelling during uh, menstrual uh, during the menstrual cycle uh, they they grow in one percent during pregnancy because when we are pregnant we need a lot of blood to feed the embryo so the blood uh, volume increases between 30 to 50 percent uh, the, the the heart works much harder in order to pump all that blood the, um, kidneys uh, grow in one percent in order to filter all that blood out. Yeah, uh, there was an interesting study that was, uh, I think, it came out a year ago that showed that women who are pregnant uh, in their calorie um, usage, uh, it's uh, similar to um, people who. Uh, trained for ultra marathon. Ultra marathon is everything longer than a marathon. Yeah. So women do that for nine months. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. What about, what about breast pain? I know that's something that's just the hormones, breast pain before you get your period. Also, yeah. 
Um, I don't know what to say about it's that. I, that I've it's had pressure. I feel like like it's yeah. not. Really, I don't like it's something way. that a lot of women experience. Yeah. It's a it's yeah. there is a very long list of what PMS yeah. comprises of and. Um, uh, pain uh, in our in our breasts is is one of them. It has been um, suspected that premenstrual pain uh, is something that has an autoimmune uh, origin to it, meaning that we have some kind of um, internal uh, sensitivity uh, to oh. the progesterone and estrogen uh, dynamics, which might oh, okay. cause these reactions. Wow. But again, um, as, as we've uh, talked about the link yeah. between estrogen and cancer, I feel that it's the same. It's an right. inner cultural conflict with right. our... Let's find a scapegoat uh, as opposed to just, you know, it's your great, yeah. great, 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 great grandmother knocking at your uterus. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> estrogen and progesterone, the female hormones are very charged uh, because femininity is very charged. Uh, and our body signifies the entire world. It signifies the entire culture. So if the culture has a complex relationship with, with femininity, it, it's not that crazy to think that we, uh, you know, personally have a complex relationship with our female hormones. Wow, beautiful. One of the things I learned, um, I'm not sure if it, if it was with the nursing degree or, or midwifery was that um, in the ancient times women were feared because they bled and didn't die, whereas a warrior bled Whoa. and died. Oh, so and that it makes us fearsome. <laughs> yeah. So, wow. Yeah. There is a funny quote from uh, an encyclopedia from the first century uh, that kind of documents what women shouldn't do because they're on their period. So they shouldn't, um, you know go to the cows because uh, the cows would be cursed or they shouldn't go to the field when they're menstruating because it would ruin the harvest and all kinds of yeah. funny stuff uh yeah. that the bees would escape yeah, yeah. um i think so we, st we well you know we're we're uh, laughing at it from something that uh, was written two thousand years ago but we're we're still afraid of of menstruation we're still afraid of pms it's still something that's not um so it's easily negative, talked about into it like a it's a bad like a lot of people just they don't appreciate what's happening they don't see it as a a part of their life they see it as a you know a chore curse. Yeah. yeah and they call it the curse or something the curse anyway, yeah. yeah yeah so powerful. <laughs> so then is it the is it any uh surprise that we are afraid of it that we dislike the pain any woman who's listening now and she has daughters, I would so encourage her to um, make a, a beautiful ceremony with her daughter when she gets her period for the first wow. time to teach her how to work with her periods. That's why in, in these uh, group sessions that I have, we all, we, I just generally call it working with our periods because it's working with our periods, using it as an opportunity to dig deep, to um, find, um, hidden connections between yourself and your maternal lineage it's something that's beautiful and, and the most beautiful thing about it is that it can be done every month and um even if you don't have the energy to do it every month there's next month yeah. uh, and it's something yeah, that not... every woman goes through between 400 and 500 times in her life Whoa. It's... <laughs> yeah Daphne, have you got anything on your website about that can you? Yeah, I we, have a lot. We, I want to write it down. Okay. So we need to put Daphne's website address w on w our Medicine Woman? Uh, no, it's in Hebrew. So it's Eshet uh, Malpe. So it's uh, E S H E T. E S H E T. E S H E T. And then how do you call that line? Hyphen. Yeah, Malpe. So it's M A R P E. M. RPE dot com dot com okay. and I have and a lot of articles mean, about everything that we talked great. about. Wow. And, yeah. and what about the article? No, sorry, so it's Eshet, E S H E T. Okay, I'm going to change Eshet it. Nope. Putting your yeah. name. Which is uh, okay. Medicine Woman in Hebrew. Oh, oh, I love yeah, it. Okay. So E yeah. Okay, got that there as well. Yeah. yeah. M A R P E. 
medicinewoman.com. So medicine woman. And um, what is your your Facebook? Uh, my name, Daphne Mago. Okay, wonderful. You're so full of information. <laughs> you want to talk about every little thing. It really, really, and I know it's getting late and you have a big day tomorrow and you're a mommy and your baby's a year old. And so yeah. we, uh, we will have you back again because Rose and I are going to be at this for a long, long time. And... Uh, <laughs> And um, I'm thank so you so much excited. for having me. Yeah, it was uh, fascinating beautiful. talking yeah. Uh, yeah. with both of you. Yeah, really, really. Now, that, no, tomorrow, if you get a chance, would you have a look in on the feed on this and see if mm -hmm. there's anything that um, someone's asked you that they could um, that you could respond? Yeah, because, of course. You know, we could. Yeah. yeah, because that way they like it, as they listen to this now, it'll be later on that they'll come yeah. up with questions yeah. or whatever. And then that way they've got they've got a, a, able to get back to you. If, um, yeah. Well, if that's I'm going to right send this. Uh, we're going to say good night in a minute and good morning to Rose and good night to you. But I'm going to um, put it on the, our site and send it around again with your name to ask questions. And then it'll be on our YouTube, which I'll send you a copy. And just so happy to have you here. It was really a delight. It's been delightful. Thank, Thank you so Daphne. much for having Thank me. You. Good yeah. night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Good morning. Sleep well. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.